Leadership is the art of giving people a platform for spreading ideas that work. Welcome to DC Local Leaders, the podcast where we talk to C-suite leaders within the DC area. Our guests share their pathways to success and the important moments that impacted their careers. Lean in as we get the inside scoop on how they are shaping their industries, how they lead, manage, and connect with others. From the sectors of aerospace, defense, tech, IT, and more, this is Local Leaders. Your host has been making meaningful connections with industry leaders for over 15 years. Here's Philip Natrum. Hello and welcome. Welcome back to the DC Local Leaders Podcast. I'm your host, Philip Nathram, and today's guest is Sumit Srivastav. Sumit is the CEO and president of Array, a technology firm based right here in Northern Virginia. They specialize in helping our federal government, predominantly in, the, in defense. Sumit, not only is he the leader of Array, he is a huge Star Wars fan and a firm believer in the power of philanthropy. He spends a lot of his personal time dedicating to George Mason University and helping that school grow, the business school, helping them give back to other entrepreneurs and other leaders in our area that want to better themselves, that want to learn a new skill. He's a big proponent of continuing to learn. He talks about that. If you're growing your business, you need to continue to be learning. He takes us through the inflection points of small business from adding that first employee all the way through deciding whether or not you want to stay a lifestyle business. Do you want to compete in a higher market? How do you scale? What are the appropriate positions to put in place in order to do that? Uh, Just a wealth of knowledge for any leader, any aspiring entrepreneur. I hope that you enjoy this episode. Um, And thank you again to everyone who's been liking our content. As I said before, our website is coming out within the next couple of weeks. We're putting the final touches on there. One of the things we're going to be able to do is those Mindset Maker Book Club. Uh, It's all the books that we talk about on the podcast with our entrepreneurs, with our leaders, as well as anything else that people have sent in. We do a recap of what we learned from there just to help you decompress that information. We're looking forward to that coming out. And again, DC Local Leaders is continuing to host Let's Talk Tech with NVTC. That's a partnership between Northern Virginia Technology Council and DC Local Leaders. And again, I do want to say that we're big fans of NoteCast. Notecast is a veteran-owned company. They're good friends of the show. They've started an app, and I would encourage everyone to take a look at that. It's exactly what it sounds like. You can take notes directly from the app while listening to a podcast. Notecast. Simply hit the button that says transcribe, and it will transcribe a note for you in the form of an audio note or a written note that you can then send to yourself. So please check those guys out. Um, Big fans of the show. And so let's get into the episode. All right, Sumit Srivastav, Array Technologies. We're here. We're in your office in Chantilly, and um, I really appreciate you taking some time to chat with us. I'm really excited. Uh, Even from our first conversation, I can tell that you're just this wealth of knowledge of not just mindset and leadership, but of our specific technology and GovCon world, and I can't wait to get that on this podcast. Well, I really appreciate that. I really enjoyed our first conversation, and when you brought this up, it was uh, really exciting, so thank you for the opportunity. Uh, Yeah, well... You know, why don't you tell us a little bit about Array, what you guys do, how you get started, that sort of thing. Sure, sure. Um, so Array's been around since 97, 20, 24 years now. I actually came into Array about 12 years ago as part of um, the founder's intent to think about growing and scaling through his uh, journey uh, at the time. And, and so we were, I think, about $18 million in revenue at the time. So he had that decision he had to make of... Do I want to sort of stay lifestyle and do I want to stay small business or do I really want to scale? And he had some mentors. He came from a company um, called Multimax, um, which is now became part of Harris IT Services and then Periton, of course. Uh, with all of that, he uh, called his mentors and basically said, what do I want to do? And, and so that's how I came in. Um, and interestingly enough, we were uh, what I would suggest is a you know typical Beltway bandit, a, a lot of 8A work, um, quite a few agencies that we were in still trying to figure out where we wanted to go. And and that really was why I was brought here is to help with that strategy and figure out the post 8A strategy. And around 2010, um, we effectively began the journey that 
answers your question, which is today we're effectively, uh, we're an application services firm that really leads with client intimacy, mostly around the defense space. So most of our business is defense oriented and even within that sphere, heavy in the defense logistics arena. So the systems that enable um, your logistics and supply chain and analytics and maintenance operations. And, and so we work the IT and the application side of that. Uh, but, you know, at its core, the 32nd would be a defense logistics oriented app services a company. What was it before? Well, um, you know, before I would say that it's what probably a lot of, you know, your listeners are very familiar with in terms of um, the federal contracting marketplace. Uh, we built the company or Brian, Brian Lung, he built the company as many entrepreneurs do where you, you know, you start by yourself, you're billing, you go through this process where at some point you can get out of the billing, which happens typically at 15, 20 people, kind of the first inflection point of a of the journey. Um, and, and then you start hiring people to help go after and grow. And so in his case, he had the mentor protege relationship with Multimax and, you know, built around in effect a little bit of where they were, you know, whether it was uh, some army, air force, state department, homeland security. So a lot of places, but still at 18 million. And so a typical challenge, because now you're thinking, um, you've hit this next inflection point where you're trying to think, what do I do next? Do I keep grow trying to grow? Do I not? And, it, and you're still struggling though, to kind of figure out who you really are. So we had, uh, it work and, applications and infrastructure and networking and VTC. We were actually doing some translation work for the State Department in Southwest Asian languages and, uh, you know, Chinese. Um, as, as, you know, as a country, we were dealing with, obviously, those issues. And um, so we were a little bit of everything. And so during that time, that was the time where we looked and we actually, we were around 30 million at that point where we said, there's this $4 million piece of array that as we look at the market and we look at what we think we want to be on the other side as uh, hopefully somebody who can compete against your typical names, the CACIs and the Perspective slash Peritons or GDIT, Serco, Deloitte, Accenture. I mean, those are the typical people we'd compete with. Um, what does that look like? And that's why we picked this sort of $4 million piece. We took the rest of the company and sort of ran that, okay, we got to complete those contracts. We've got to do whatever we can to extend them. But really what we're doing is moving that and investing in this $4 million Air Force defense logistics system environment, and then trying to grow that. And, you know, today we're now $70 million and mostly that space. So you got a singular focus at that point. And, and you mentioned something very specific. It was uh, an inflection point. Yeah. So you mentioned two, um, Right. The first. Yeah. One. The first one is, you know, again, a journey that I think so many people are familiar with is um, that entrepreneurial spirit that and bug that hits somebody. And you say, hey, I want to I'm working for, in this case, Brian, you know, with Multimax, but I want to start my own business. So you 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 go to whomever, you know, and in this case, he goes to the Multimax owner and who was a personal and professional mentor and says, you know, I want to start this thing and they, they collaborate and, and ultimately you start out. Now for a lot of people that might be going to a client and saying, look, I'm working for so-and-so, but I'm, I want to start my own. I've hung a shingle out there and often in the small business space, you know, that's easier to do obviously in federal. So now you're billing and you're spending 40 hours a week, 50 hours a week doing nothing but billing because you're covering your bills, you're covering your mortgage, you're paying for your groceries, you know, all the things that as an individual entrepreneur you do. And and, and, and then the journey starts where you start adding people. And that's where, you know, typically, I think in our space with federal IT, I, I, I've determined or not determined, but suggested that 15 to 20 people is probably the place where if you're living a reasonable lifestyle, um, that you're making enough margin that you can actually come out of the billing and actually be your own BD person. And you think that's that's inflection point. number That's two. number one. That's number yeah, one. Number one is really when you're no longer having to bill. So during this time, though, so you're if you in in the in the case of Brian or just a, a normal uh, yeah. normal person, um, I mean, at this point, you are, are you outsourcing your your benefits and your payroll and everything is being outsourced. You're paying a fee for all of that, and you're focused on 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 what? Just billing back the client? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, you know, there you you really aren't making enough money to have dedicated of anything, right? Mm -hmm. So you might be. Actually, in some cases, a lot of people, instead of having employees, might be actually bringing them in as 1099s. Mm -hmm. They're billing through your rates and all that, but you're not taking on all of those responsibilities of providing a benefit and all that. And of course, ACA 
changed some of that where now there were some options in, with the exchanges and other things for people to buy. But um, it's a mix of that W-2 and 1099, and you're definitely buying fractions of stuff. And in a lot of cases, you're doing it yourself, right? You're, I mean, this is one of the things about entrepreneurship in the early days, something I've never truly experienced in my career, um, where you're your own bookkeeper. You're the one going up on the websites and trying to figure out, you know, what does a teaming agreement look like? And, um, but this is also where it becomes really important to have those mentors in the community. So when you do start to know that, Hey, I can call this person and, uh, if nothing else, have them review a document for me or have them tell me what's the best way for me to go buy some insurance or provide a benefit plan of some sort. Um, but it's a real struggle at that smaller stage. And I think in most cases, you're right. It's outsourced in some way or done by yourself. So, so in at, at that inflection point, number one, is that where you came into array when they were at number one, I, more or less? I was probably, I was more at three. You were at so, three. Yeah, so, so what's the second one? Yeah. Right? The second one is when you start to get to 50 employees, when you start to have a certain num amount of scale and it's different for different kind of regulations, but that 50 is pretty critical where, uh, department of labor starts to pay interest. Uh, you start to potentially get on the radar for audits and EEOC compliance and, you know, things like that. And, and so that becomes the next point where you really have to now think about the maturity of those business processes. The question you just asked where do I, can I really afford to do my own bookkeeping or do I need to have a little better books? It, you may not still be audited, but you still need to have maybe reviews and, uh, you, you now need to have certain data that you capture about the people that you're hiring and even the people you're recruiting and your method of recruitment. And are you really opening yourself up? Um, opening the aperture on, on the sources, right? Because again, EOC compliance, for example. So I think that's inflection point two is not just the scale, but the maturity of your back office and the things you're now doing and investing in or should be investing in so you don't get in trouble later. Um, that's inflection point two. And then as you go through that, let's say that's 50, um, I call inflection point three, really in our world, we're so driven by the NAICS code uh, that we are in and and what those graduation numbers look like. So if you're in federal IT at 30 million, it, to me, it's the half-life. What I call the half-life is it really inflection point three, which is the point in time where you're in that 15, maybe 20 million, you know, sort of the halfway point of the, of the journey. And you really have to make a decision at that time. Am I in this for the long haul? And am I in this to scale the business? And do I want to go through the 30 million or build a lifestyle business? And I think in federal in particular, at inflection point three, the majority of companies are probably best positioned to stay a lifestyle business, stay small, stay in your socioeconomic categories, and work at the 15 to 20 million level and not even worry about graduation. Um, and, and then finally, inflection point four is you've decided, I want to scale. And it's really that post-graduation survival and everything you have to do to have built the company to sort of beat the big guys and stay afloat. You know, you know that was a great education for anyone who's an aspiring leader, um, whether they're aspiring entrepreneurs or someone who's more technical in their position that wants to be in more of a leadership role. Right. So tell me a little bit more about, you know, along the way, you mentioned so many things there about mentorship and the importance of doing that um, and having that. What's been your experience with that and how do you practice that? And, and what do you think that's really done for your ability to be at those inflection points and make the best decision? Sure. Um, yeah, I, I, honestly, that that's a very simple answer. It's my dad. <laughs> so, you know, dad started um, uh, his journey and like many, you know, immigrant stories, right? He uh, came over here in the early 70s to do his computer science master's degree at, at Chapel Hill, UNC. And so I came along when I was five. And but there was always there was something about that, the same parameters or the same characteristics that drive someone to leave their country and look for that better life here in the U.S., as many, many have done and, and, and have achieved. Um, the, the, probably the same characteristics that drive entrepreneurial spirit in many cases, right? You see this over and over again. Um, and, and so he had that. And so when I was a junior in high school is when he started his company and we were, we were living here in Burke. So I was going to Robinson high school here in Fairfax. Um, but he started his company in junior year and did, you know, and I've watched from afar just being the kid to see that journey. Um, and then as I came in, he was right around, um, 
11 million a year, I think, when he was really pushing me to come in. I had just gotten married and he was like, hey, you know, the company's going to grow and you really need to join. He was jumping from like 4 million to 11 million that year. He's so- so was that inflection point number one, more or less? Yeah, right? in his case, yeah, that was really the, the two, really, where he was, uh, he had been doing some billing, um, but he at that point was also starting to run the company and all that, and he'd uh, hired some people. So um, it was really that time where get in early and learn the back office and all that. So, so you know, really to kind of get back to your question, that whole, every just watching dad, and then dad ends up with this amazing you know, the first five years that I worked in his organization, I didn't work for him directly for five years. So I was working with the control for the controller and some others uh, for a couple of years, actually. Um, but during that time, he won the Ernst & Young Entrepreneur of the Year Award. He won um, the SBA Sm- National Small Business Person of the Year Award. He got appointed in the mid-90s to a Clinton Commission, um, White House Commission on um, Minority Small Business Contracting and, and sort of the macroeconomic stuff. So I'm watching all this happen and I'm watching what he's doing and it was just an incredible learning round. So the whole 90s, my first third of my career, basically, I worked in dad's organization before he sold it and learned quite a bit. But the other thing that was really neat uh, and allowed me to kind of keep sort of engaged, you know, in terms of learning and mentorship is because he was so well-known in the community and in particular the Indian American community. He was also the co-founder and sort of the chair, uh, chairman of the, uh, of what is now Rajasthani Mandir, but the temple, the Indian temple in Western Fairfax County. Um, so a lot of people were coming to him and there's this next generation of entrepreneurs, especially in government contracting that came to him and they were probably closer to my age than they were his, uh, at that point. But, that gave me this incredible ability from the inside to see the way he mentored people, the way, you know, they responded, the things they did. There are four or five of them that all sold their companies. I mean, I think the least valued company of the sale was like 120 million and some of them sold for two to $300 million. So you see that kind of journey also with all these other folks. And it was just an incredible learning experience. So I, I'd say, you know, once again, um, just following dad, and trying to live up to what I saw him doing has sort of been my aspiration for 30 years now in the public sector. Um, nowhere close to being there, but you know. Yeah. But I mean, I think the, the idea that he was your mentor, that you, you had a mentor and you watched him mentor other people, um, is huge, right? Because I, I think that what I found in most of the leaders that I've spoke to, whether they themselves were the person that founded a company or they were brought in, um, as a part of a company and work their way through the ranks to be in a leadership role, whatever it is, they had people to look up to that were, that were doing what they wanted to be doing. But then also those same people were turning around and helping others. Yeah. Um, so having that lens or that, just that experience of seeing that. It's really interesting about that too, in terms of self awareness, right? Is I get, I'm getting caught up at the t- early on. Oh, dad's this amazing entrepreneur. I'm starting to learn these stories because, which is a kid from the outside, he's just dad. Right. When you're on the inside, you're seeing this. And I remember having this thing about entrepreneurship and what I thought it was. Um, and a couple of years in, I remember in a board meeting or a, a senior staff meeting where uh, I was pushing back on some stuff with dad, right? And I, as a kid, as his son, I was probably able to push back a little more. Uh, and I remember him getting really mad saying, well, you're not an entrepreneur. And it hurt. It, it was interesting. It hurt me at the time. But it also, in the follow-up conversations and in really sitting down with them, I started realizing that actually my passion is around operationalizing strategy. My, where I, I didn't experience that, you know, the 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 fighting for survival as a single uh, person entrepreneur and trying to get the second person build and the fourth. I didn't experience any of that in any part of my career. I was always coming in at you know the smallest company was his when it was already getting to eleven million. And at Array, it was 18 million. And the company he sold to in between was a billion dollar firm. So, so I'd, I'd, but early, a couple of years in is when that, that mentorship and really the frankness of the conversation allowed me to start to really self reflect about what I was, where my passions lay, and, and then realizing I'm not that type of entrepreneur. I'm an operator. And, and so anyway, you know, it, it really is important to have that kind of, um, person that you can have those very, very, um, transparent conversations with. Well, let's talk about, you just mentioned that you're, you're an operator. Um, let's talk about that through the lens of array, Yeah. right? What kind of company culture do you have at array? And if you, you know, you consider yourself to be, sounds like part of the team and, and more of, um, 
you know, a leadership role within the team and less of like, I'm the entrepreneur and I am. Yeah. yeah. Well, and, and the fact is that, you know, um, the founder, I'm not the founder, right? I wasn't the person whose vision array originally was. So when I came in, uh, what's interesting is part of that conversation, I actually met, I think about a hundred when I left Keen. So the, the company that bought dad in December 99 was Keen, which is now NTT data. And, uh, so I was there for seven, eight years and that was a great experience. But when I left, I was actually, my fourth child had just been born, my daughter, um, after three sons. And I was going to take the rest of the year off. I was going to hang at home. I was going to get to know my kids again, you know, all that kind of stuff. And I probably met, uh, about a hundred folks during the next six to nine months, right? Entrepreneurs. And one of the things that I was really looking for was an organization and an entrepreneur in particular who, whose vision met mine when it came to corporate culture, when it came to the fact that, you know, uh, there, I think there's a strong humility that goes with really building the kind of culture you have where you have to sort of let it subsume. I mean, you have to have the vision, but you also have to, you know, allow for others to come into that mix. You have to, you know, create that diversity of thought and, and, and have an inclusive culture. And, and with Brian, you know, I, I mean, there were a few that I met, but Brian just took it to another level. And I was like, this is a guy I could work for. And in particular, because they were at a certain uh, size, which was very important to me because it was just big enough where I didn't have to worry about those things I knew I was weak in, right? Which is that, that early stage survival, but they had some infrastructure, but it allowed me after, you know, what effectively was the first 20 years of my career to play out this hypothesis about culture, to play out the thing that if we really build a small business emerging story that Array was interested in, I could bring some folks in that I'd met over the years that had that same belief where, you know, you'd sit around and say, wow, I wish my company was like, and what Brian was, I mean, we were blessed to be able to do is come together as a team. So I brought in folks who were former clients, former employees, former competitive partners that I hated losing to, but really respected. And that initial management team was made up of those folks. And we brought with us this idea that we will embody what we always said we wanted our companies to embody. That really became it. And it, it was a culture where we were all, I mean, I'd, be, I'd run a $200 million organization before I came here. You know, another gentleman came here who was, you know, had run a $180 million company. Um, so uh, we came together with the idea that although we weren't previous owners of companies, we had run some pretty mature organizations and yet we were really roll up the sleeves people. We loved getting into the mix of things. We loved walking around. It didn't matter what role you had in the company. There was no hierarchy, which was a little odd for the defense people who were coming in because they were used to very hierarchical. But they, what you found is that there were people that really wanted that. And so we, we have this very walk around culture. My first weekend, just running coffee runs for the proposal team and being the person checking the books and stuff because I'm not a tech writer. I didn't grow up technical, so I never really wrote a proposal in my life. Uh, and yet, you know, I'm running this company, uh, which is all about in our industry doing RFP responses. So, but it was that kind of culture. And then, and then just getting out of people's way, right? When you're hiring these people that you respect like you do, uh, you need to empower them. And so we, we did this interesting study uh, just two years ago, two and a half years ago, where we had an independent firm come in, uh, actually a group from George Mason, a capstone team that was in their knowledge management team. And it was very interesting because we said, we're starting with a whiteboard. We're not going to tell you, and we don't want to say this is the culture. We've never done a culture study. You go figure out what you think or what our employees think our culture is. And they came back and they basically said there are three words that sort of have come out of the work that your employees effectively say is the culture of the company and you've never ever stated it. We didn't come out and say, here's our value system. We just behaved the way we wanted everyone to behave and we hired people that we would allow for that. And the three words were family, empowerment, and impact. And then the supporting stuff was family was really around, you know, we have people that, you know, support us. It feels like a unit. Leaders are accessible. Uh, we feel like they have our back. We can take risks. You know, we can be ourselves, right? We can effectively be who we are and we're not forced to conform or any of that. So that was sort of the words around family. Empowerment was they let us do what we need to do to get the job done. You know, we do feel empowered. We feel tooled. We feel like we get what we need to actually do what's most important for our clients and execute. An impact was that we have that communication environment where we're seeing the impact to our careers, we're seeing the impact we're having to the company, and we can see the impact we have with our clients, and we see the reward systems and the communications that support that. 
and that's like motherhood and apple pie in our right? yeah. when you're hearing that back and saying that's what they think of you without you even talking about it I, that's probably the most pride i take of anything we've done at array is is having built a culture without talking about it yeah i think that's one of the best ex explanations of what the company culture has been it came out organically you didn't create it it was given to you by the employees because that's what they felt right um, and I can tell by listening to you that it that it makes sense why they would feel that way. Um, so. You're just energetic and and just a champion of what you do. Thank you. Where does do, do you where does that come from? Do you have I mean where did you learn those um, those te Are you reading anything? Are you following people? I mean you know I I do a lot of work on a morning routine yeah. and follow a number of different people between Brene Brown and Tim Ferriss and um, the list goes on. Mickey Singer and a whole meditation routine, cold showers, like a whole thing <laughs> just to have this sort of mindset. You seem to just, it seems organic. Right? Well, yeah. I, I don't know if it's organic. I would say this, and you'll probably get tired of this. Um, this is what I saw dad doing. I mean, I, you know. Um, Where'd he get it from? Do you yeah, know? Did you I, watch? Did you, were you able to see that? I think in watching him, I mean, I think of like, even before he started the company and the way people were attracted to him, he was a, he was a genuine person. He was highly... Uh, you know, competent in what he did, but he had a passion about, uh, you know, one of the things that he was passionate about when he started the temple was he wanted to be a temple for the common man. I, you know, one thing, you know, for those listeners that might not be too familiar with this, but, you know, India, and you think about Indian immigrants, I mean, we're uh, a bunch of smaller communities, right? Uh, because India itself wasn't really a nation until it became a nation in 47 until then it was a bunch of princely estates and, you know, under this East India company thing. But you think about the pedigree and, and, you know, one of the things I saw with dad is he didn't care what part, I mean, of India you came from, right? Like to him, the important thing about this temple and the important thing about what he was doing in the community was we could be South Indians. We could be North Indians. We could be Punjabis, Biharis, Gujaratis. It really didn't matter to him. He wanted, and he had a, this strong philosophy that, if we're going to be a community here in this land away from our homeland, then it needed to be a community for everyone. It needed to be a community for the common man. And, and honestly, it didn't matter if you were Hindu or Jan or, you know, whatever subset of uh, sort of Hinduism or Buddhism, he accepted it all. And he was, and I saw that with him uh, right from early on, as far as I can remember. So I, I would say that, you know, and he applied that in the company. Like, I mean, it was amazing to me that he could go there and he knew everyone's name. He knew their spouse's names. We're 600 people at this point. And yet he had this uh, an amazing ability to just connect with anyone that he worked with. And, he, and the hierarchy didn't mean anything. Now, you know, he's chairman of the board, chairman of the temple. You still have to assert certain things about vision and all that. And, you know, that would come out. His temper would come out sometimes, too, as it did with me that, at that meeting. But the way he treated people and the kinds of things he did to make everyone feel like they were part of something bigger. Um, you know, you, like I said, I, I'll spend the rest of my life trying to emulate as much of that as I can and, and drive it home uh, and get a fraction of the achievement he had. But um, I'll tell you, everything started with that. And, and do you so but talk to me a little bit about your individual yeah, so, i mean i know you've got a lot of kids yeah. well not a lot but you've got, <laughs> it is a lot <laughs> I, I don't know why I, said, I don't know why i said it that way um you've got some kids yeah. you've got a family is how i should say that i suppose yeah and uh do you have a morning routine what does your morning yeah, look like yeah. do you have an evening routine like so um interesting it's evolved quite a bit over the years right so um i i would say that there is a routine now that is about the kids that is relatively new. And I'd say the last, it's a little bit of what attracted me to Array, um, but uh, a, a, an environment that allows us to be who we are again. And I missed out in the 90s. You know, so my oldest is 29. The next one's 24. So they were born in the 90s and then two more that were born 2004, 2008. So, you know, while I was at Keen and I realized that whether it was in the 90s working for dad where I was trying to prove I wasn't there just for nepotism purposes, but that I really deserve to be there. So you're, you're working a lot more than you maybe you should, I should have, um, which meant that the older kids probably didn't get anywhere near as much time with me. Then I go through the keen period of eight years where the next two were born and they were early enough now. And, and I sort of learned enough, but it was still, we were going through acquisition. We were a publicly traded company. So there are other things that come with that. And I started realizing that I had been missing out on stuff. And I also started realizing that, you know, there were things that were really important to me and they were about the kids. They were actually common experiences. I'm a huge sports fan. 
and I was missing out on all that. I'm a big book reader and I would normally uh, read one novel a week on average for many years. And then all that time I stopped reading uh, and I realized how much I was missing that huge science fiction fan, you know, all this stuff. Now I own 700 star Wars books and I've read all of them, right? Uh, 15 bookshelves worth of fiction, nonfiction at home that, you know, I've gone through. So that really only happened in the last 10 years. And it's, you know, something I would tell people that are listening that I awakened, I think, to what I wanted to be and should be a lot later. Despite all that I just said about dad and all that, I spent so much time working on my career. Um, then rather than realizing that I think there is, you know, this adage of a marathon, right? Life mm -hmm. is that. So now my morning routine inevitably starts with waking up the kids. I love being their alarm clock, I probably baby them a little too much, but um, waking them up, uh, helping with breakfast, uh, helping them get off to school when they were going to school. Now it's just back to the bedroom to, uh, to do virtual training online. Um, but I, I like to do that. And usually what I do is I get up a little earlier than them and I catch up on overnight stuff. I catch up on news. Um, but basically from about six, six thirty to nine, I'm just in my own relaxed state and I don't do yoga and I don't do the cold showers, but really it's the stuff that I'm passionate about. So I'll read a book. Uh, I've always got it right now. Well, the new, um, high Republic series came out, uh, for star Wars. So there's a, okay. um, uh, there's a, it's many, many generations before, uh, what we all know to be the star Wars canon. So it's starting a, in effect, a new canon there, but you know, I also, right now I just finished, um, there's a book that I read that, uh, every year, at least once, which, uh, called the, um, why philanthropy matters. And it was another thing emanating from dad and his, the culture of philanthropy I saw with him. Um, but it, it, I use that to remind myself every, you know, all the time that no matter what we do, um, we still have this bigger purpose in life. Yeah. And, uh, so why philanthropy matters. And then the other thing that was, uh, I just finished, uh, you know, given our space, um, I love Grisham. I love Vince Philan. I love that area. But, uh, Chris Whipple just put out a, a new book, uh, I think in the fall, um, the spy masters an update to that, which is about the history of basically CIA directors. And that was a really cool, um, just sort of connects, to the nonfiction passion uh, the, and the fiction passion effectively with GovCon as well as, uh, you know, uh, that genre. So, yeah. So you, you mentioned something earlier when you were speaking about, um, and it sounded like you were saying, like there was a, some feelings or some emotions about do I, of belonging. Do I belong here or am I just here because my father owns the company and I'm put here that I don't actually deserve it. Yep. Talk to me about what was going through your mind or how you worked through that or, what that felt like in the first place and then what you did. And when did you actually start feeling like, you know what, I, I, I've learned what I needed to learn and I am a leader and I can do this. Um, probably never during the time I was working for him. And, and so he, you know, I started in 91, he started me in the back office. So I never really got in front of clients. I wasn't ever billing on site. I never had that side of the business. So I found myself, he moved me around the back office and basically said, you need to really understand how a company operates. Um, and so I did that for a couple of years and then I would just done my MBA at George Mason. So the other thing was, you know, doing my MBA and, and that started to give me a little confidence because now I'm in this class and I was eight years younger. It was an executive MBA, that Friday, Saturday kind of thing. Um, so it was mid career professionals looking to take the next step and almost everybody, I think I was youngest by eight years of the 24, 25 of us in the cohort. So that actually was a little bit tough in the beginning, too, because I'm sitting there thinking, now, do I belong here? Um, but over those two years, as I got to meet folks and I got to engage a more senior group outside of my dad's environment where maybe the VPs listened to me or paid more attention to me because I was his son, they, there was none of that during this cohort. Um, so graduating from there, getting my MBA in 94 and really beginning to um, see how I was interacting with others outside in the business world. I started getting a little more feeling, but it was still, you know, I'm still not quite there. Then dad had a stroke in 96, his first stroke. And uh, I was just forced to take over the company for a brief period. He came back a couple of months later. I mean, it was a mild stroke, but still scary. Um, and for a couple of months, he couldn't engage. And so I had to take over and I was frankly ill prepared. I mean, I, there was uh, nothing led me to be prepared for that. But that's the first time I really started getting in front of clients, right? I had to go talk to people. I mean, the the company was called Anstec. Anstec and Sri Srivastava were synonymous, as it is often with uh, uh, founder-led companies. Is you can't tell the difference between the two; it's all one and the same. 
so I had to kind of deal with that. I had to deal with VPs who were getting scared because that was the same year we were graduating from the 8A program. We were about 60 million at the time when he had this stroke. Um, we had just taken that 70,000 square foot commitment at 1410 Spring Hill Road where, uh, and, and so there was all of this stuff going on that was kind of negative and uh, trying to hold that together helped me a little more. But we also then went through a downturn, right? Because key VPs left to go to some of our protege companies and because they felt like the company was going down. Uh, you have the natural 8A sort of post 8A world blues that people come into where you're converting the company and all that. So I, so we finally got to a point in 98-ish where we felt like we'd stabilize the company at 35, 40 million and that it might be worth going ahead and selling. And that's when we started the process and sold at the end of 2000 uh, or 1999. And so I would say that, you know, as these things are happening, I was maybe getting a little more confidence as I was taking on more challenges. You know, to be honest with you, I think that whole time I still felt like, uh, and I, I definitely feel that way now, that I was ill prepared for this. And I'm, and I told him, and he passed away a couple of years ago, but all the way till the end that, you know, his familial love, his love for me was a real problem in running the company because he frankly should have brought in professional leadership and a true operator to, to be able to hand that off to. And instead he had me. And, uh, and so unfortunately a lot of those lessons learned that the company had, that he had, and that I had were all kind of in the family. Um, and I think the results might, they were decent results, but they would have been different if we actually had more, what I'll call professional leadership brought in at the time. What do you think that experience does for you and your ability to do to lead array now? Uh, everything, right. Yeah. I tell, I mean, there is no better experience, uh, learning experience than the, the stuff that, uh, impacts you negatively or the, yeah. you know, the, the bad stuff. Um, uh, the learning that I had at that time, uh, in terms of, you know, what post eight, a, like what were we, we were, you know, once again, 60, 65 million of eight, a work. And yet we had everything from early days of artificial intelligence, right? The expert system based stuff to mail rooms that we ran at PTO and NASA head. We won the mail room of the year, the same year we were doing expert systems work for WMATA uh, and the, and the, you know, mass tra transit system. You know, what happens though, is that that's a bunch of piece parts of things. And we were in seven or eight cabinet level agencies. So by the time you're coming out of that, you can't compete on any front. You're just a bunch of like, a, you know, I use the term a hodgepodge of contracts under the governance of one corporate entity without any mission. And so, all of that has pretty much informed everything I've done for the last 20 years now. And, and I think the success at Array, you know, if you connect it to that hypothesis that we were talking about earlier in the 2008 to 10 when I first got here and sort of the strategy we put forward to, to the founder to say, here's how we're going to move forward, all was built on that 10 years at Anstec, all that learning, and then, uh, frankly, quite a bit from the Keen days where, you, you know, we were a publicly traded firm, but a wholly owned subsidiary of 100, 200 million having to compete against the multi-billion players. And I learned quite a bit there too. You know, this, this, this whole journey of you trying to fit in in your dad's company, and what has that taught you about belonging and fitting in? And if there's a difference between the two and what do you think about that? Yeah, um, absolutely. And connect, you know, think about the culture conversation we had, right? Um, to, to me, I, I think I, I learned from dad early on and, and saw the power of diversity and inclusivity in action right from the beginning, right? Uh, different viewpoints, different experience sets and what they do and the what we'll call the unstated. And, and so to a great degree, you know, fitting in um, assumes that there's some culture. It presumes here's what you have to do to be a part of this organization. And, and we really said, nah. We don't, you know, belonging, I mean, you know, and it's interesting you ask it that way, but to me, it's all about belonging, right? Be who you are. Um, know belonging starts from yourself and then know that this is an organization that, you know, that will accept you. And so our approach has always been, and again, going back to the culture thing, we don't say who we are you know, culturally. We don't say that you, this is the value system that you have to apply here mm. Because to some degree, that means you have to subsume some elements of who you are to be able to fit into array. Well, no, come in and bring all of that. Bring your, you know, thing. You will, you will work here. Um, you already and belong. You already belong. Everybody can belong at array. There is no issue. And we value that that belonging brings with it 
um, your value system, at your uh, who you are, and all the diversity of thought and the power that comes with that, and then and then just unleash it. And so, you know, when you think about last year and everything that the country is continues to go through, but really the awakening as a country we had, and I felt like one of the things that allowed us to really thrive in that environment, and it, frankly, even the messaging that I was giving inside the company was. Uh, contra to, I think a lot of companies sort of reacted by creating, you know, virtual happy hours and doing all this stuff to kind of keep people affiliated with the company. Our messaging was, we're going to be here for you. We're comfortable enough in our skin. And we understand that what's more important to you are your kids, your family, your cul-de-sac. I mean, these were the words we were using, your community, your schools, go deal with that. We, you know, like many GovCon, we weren't impacted very much with, uh, you know, with the COVID piece. And we had no, none of the skiff work and other things that had that. But that didn't mean families weren't impacted because spouses could have been impacted. And even if we had a telework culture, which 75% of our company was already doing that in the defense market, now you had a spouse at home too. You had kids at home. You had to deal with becoming an educator. So we we did a few of those things, but most of our messaging was we'll just be here for you. We're we're that the comfort food that you can come back to whenever you need to. Go focus on your families and go focus on those other things. And we're not going to put these artificial, and I, I don't well, again mean that to suggest that others didn't do it right. I mean it, you got to do what's right for your company. In our case, it was this idea that we're fine. The yeah. company's going to be fine. You don't worry about us. Go worry about yourselves and your families and your communities. Yeah, that's awesome. That you know they can be secure and. That they'll be able to, to put food on the table and, and they have a, a job to come to and that, be fulfilled That was with. far more important, right? Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and so I, I think that helped. Uh, and again, it goes to your belonging versus fitting in because, you know, we can't presume anything about any of the families that work with us. Uh, you know, even if we were fine, um, yeah. we knew. And I mean, just at home, I mean, uh, having a, a lot of what I was putting out there was stuff, you know, like, hey, I'm dealing with my 12 year old daughter and, you yeah. know, about rising seventh grader and, you know, what that's all about yeah. uh, uh, and putting some of the personal uh, stuff out there, too. And I think that's another part of the culture that, you know, I think is really important is to humanize everybody in the company. So, you know, I, I do believe I hope this is true, but that, you know, people know as much about my life. And it, frankly, even, you know, during the, the days of uh, some of the, the racial justice conversations, the extensive ones that we were having over the summer, you know, I was in my, again, in the messaging, talking about my early days in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, as a five, six-year-old, being the only Indian family that you ever saw, um, and hardly being able to speak English. I mean, I, I barely spoke English when I got here. I used to get beat up all the time, right? I mean, just coming home from the bus stop was uh, was a little bit scary because you didn't know what was going to happen on the way over and just getting home and mom would come up, but mom was wearing a sari. So then you get the ridicule of your mom wearing a sari and stuff like that. So, you know, and, and again, nothing unusual. This is something that a lot of people have faced. To me, that's that was part of the story is, you know, ensuring that people understood that one, we recognize these issues. Two, it's stuff... You know, we're not talking from some high perch as a CEO. This is like personal to us. Um, again, I hope that went some way to helping people feel like they could go do what they really need to do. You mentioned a lot about philanthropy with your, you know, previous companies and, and you know, your dad and everything. But you do a lot with George Mason for just people in this area, whether they want to be a technical person uh, or an entrepreneur or any number of things like what's going on with, with George Mason. Yeah. I appreciate you uh, asking. Um, and, and I know uh, that you know the passion that we have. It, it really, uh, you know, early on in dad's days, there were, um, he was, uh, as he started the company, he started thinking about what was important for him to have credibility. He was working at uh, GTE at the time. So he actually started doing adjunct teaching at Mason for computer science. And we lived in Burke, so we were right down the street in Burke Center. Um, so, you know, you're seeing this this entity there in Fairfax, but not really paying a lot of attention. But then I, I saw him starting to teach. Um, but then when he started the company, uh, Mason was in the early days of having started an IT degree. And so some of the people he was hiring were from Mason. And I remember in particular these four grad students that were doing work for him, living in one apartment in Vienna, uh, Indian grad students that were working on some software coding for him. Uh, then he got involved in the Minority and Diversity Advisory Board at George Mason through the Board of Trustees there with, of the foundation. So there was this early piece uh, of 
of Mason that was in my life, but not core to it. And then the MBA, uh, you know, really gave me a feeling that uh, it was, a fir- as I mentioned earlier, the first time I started getting an inkling as I'm dealing with other business people, that maybe I, I can do something here and I do belong. Um, and then, you know, the other piece and sort of bringing it to today's Mason, I mean, Mason today is completely different than that Mason uh, and what I found in education really. And that's kind of the cornerstone of this is the opportunities that people have if you allow as many people as possible to get at, you know, the education they need. And, and one thing that I loved about Mason's spirit and sort of what it's been about from the beginning is it's been this incredibly diverse, you know, university. So, you know, we're the largest university in the Commonwealth, right? With 38,000 or so enrollment, but one third roundabouts, and these are roundabout numbers, but there's like a third of Mason students who are first gen going students first in their family. There's almost another third, I think, that is uh, Pell Grant. So in effect, you know, um, coming from Title I schools and some, you know, some backgrounds where other, they wouldn't have had an opportunity to get a, a, a degree. And the fact that Mason can provide that level of access and what we call access to excellence, you know, uh, just sort of sings, right, with this idea that that's what America did for my parents parents that what that's what it did for a lot of the family friends we had growing up is it that educational system and the opportunity to create wealth and impact generations not only here but like for a lot of folks as as i know you're aware um a lot of folks were sending money back right so i mean i I know from the little straw thatched roof environment a little village that my dad's from that the number of families that have been impacted with what he was doing even when he wasn't making, you know, even when he was just barely getting by, but there was always money going back to the family. And it has now created a situation where he's, he helped 17 to 20 of our nephew, his nephews and nieces actually go to college in India, all of them now working for IT outsourcing. I mean, their, their employers are IBM, right? Or Accenture or Deloitte or Microsoft. Um, And now they're doing the same thing because they saw what philanthropy did for them. And I think that's why I read the why philanthropy matters every year, because I think the, that is part of the promise, right? That the, the, this country frankly was built on a very different model where anyone could have the opportunity to get wealth. It wasn't a class society per se. Now, again, I'm not going to, you know, we know that it wasn't the same for everybody and and we do have to fix that. Um, But there was this promise that you could come here and get that education and you could start a company and you could become a national entrepreneur of the year and you could sell it and you could have a generation like me and my siblings that could then also do some great things that, but if you stop there and if you just keep that wealth in the family, then I think you're doing a big disservice. And one cool thing about the U S kind of the American mindset has been this huge culture of philanthropy. If you go to Europe, Asian economies, a lot of that wealth sort of stays in the family. It's all about how do I keep it uh, and use it materially. And you think back to like what we've done with the Rockefellers, right? I mean, uh, and the Carnegie's and, you know, the, the Leland Stanford. I mean, our whole higher ed system effectively from a research perspective has emanated from philanthropy and, um, you know, the, the kind of promise that we give people, I think comes from that kind kind of continuum that happens where we create, we have a culture of opportunity and then entrepreneurship is very strong here versus other countries. People make their own wealth as we, like the billionaire's pledge, which is really what the, uh, why philanthropy matters, you know, sort of really brings that home of the billionaire's pledge and how, you know, the Gates Foundation and these other foundations are doing amazing things when it comes to uh, giving back. And that's always been in the culture of the thing. And then, so then it creates the wealth creation opportunity. And then the feedback loop is philanthropy again. How do we give back to let the next generation grow and to solve societal problems, not just, you know, hand it off to my kids. So my kids know they're not getting a whole lot, uh, no matter what, hopefully we get successful enough where it matters, but, uh, they know that most of it is to go help the next generation, whether it's, um, early stage, you know, or early childhood education, uh, or in the higher ed space where we have so many people that are coming back in and looking to retrain and reskill and, 
And so anyway, um, you know, that's been a big part of what I believe has continued to attract me to support Mason and the, the mission I see Mason have that I think is very different than most other higher ed institutions. And they're building a new uh, business school. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, co-chair of a campaign right now to try to uh, get a dedicated business school. So we've had a business school um, for many years. It's the largest in the, in the Commonwealth. Um, but uh, we've never had a dedicated building. And, and, and although, you know, in today's world of COVID, uh, that is not you know, you got, may question some of those, but I think it's it's more about, uh, you know, the convening entity. I think we've all learned from COVID that we can definitely be virtual and there is some power to the virtual capability and how many more people you might be able to include if they had access to, for example, broadband internet and all that, which we know not everybody does. Um, but I think there's also something to be said with both the innovation district that we're building in Arlington uh, through the Institute for Digital Innovation and what Virginia Tech is doing, obviously, in National Landing, that kind of emanated from that HQ2 decision with Amazon. But really, uh, a, it's a whole spectrum, right? So the idea that our, the Fairfax campus, the Arlington campus, and Prince William, where we have a lot of our health sciences stuff, that these all have these staples that become convening entities. And so our hope is that, uh, and what part of the campaign is, is to really bring that together into this physical instantiation that supports the virtual world that we all live in now. Um, and, and, and so the business school campaign and the Institute for Digital Innovation, which is Arlington based, um, that innovation hub, they really work in tandem because to a great degree, a lot of our employers in this area really want that full continuum of capability. So, so yeah, involved in that. And, and actually right now the alumni association president too, which is another interesting, you know, thing going on because we, we have 210,000 alums in the area, uh, which, you know, we're only 50 years old. We're about to be 50 years old as an institution. 200 and 250 year old institutions have the same number of alumni or less than we do because, and it goes back to access of excellence. We've kept growing, right? We don't cap enrollment. If you want to learn, come to Mason, right? Has been the mantra. And so we keep growing. We, I think we represent 70% of all net growth of higher ed in the Commonwealth in the last 10 years across all the institutions. And so as a result of that, uh, you know, we have this incredibly high alumni population that is also kind of coming into its own because it's relatively young as an institution. So we don't have that same multi-generation legacy that, you know, a lot of other institutions have. And I think we're just now coming into our own as a network that could have power in, in sort of the community. And that's what we're trying to do with the Alumni Association work also. What advice would you give to someone in their 20s who wants to one day be a leader? Someone who is more technical in their experience and in their day-to-day -day job who wants to make it into leadership and then others the other question would be uh, someone who's an aspiring entrepreneur who wants to start their own thing w you know from your experience and everything that we've talked about today um, what advice would you give those three separate people yeah. would it be the same there's um, sort of uh, it's a great question and and it, it does you know recognize the fact that people come into entrepreneurship or leadership from many different perspectives, right? I'd say if there's one underpinning that I would put in there, it's like, it's just constantly be a student of, of whatever it is, right? So whether you're um, like me, non-technical and sort of got these opportunities through back office functions and other things and through, a, you know, an incredible mentor to get exposed and ultimately you know, learn, um, uh, to, and grow, to become a leader. I just intently, you know, I couldn't understand, I didn't do the technology, but I spent so much time trying to understand everything from architectures, it architectures and talking to people and reading. And I was going to technology classes, um, just so I could understand what these guys were talking about. Right. And, and so there was, there's a learning that comes with that and, and, and whatnot. And then there was the other piece where I realized I love public sector mission, but I didn't always understand it. Right. And, uh, there's some very unique elements to government and government contracting. It's actually one of the things we've launched at Mason is this center for government contracting, which looks at the business of government contracting. So historically for many years now, as the growth of contracting has uh, become more and more important in terms of how government operates, most uh, institutions, most organizations attack it from the regulatory side, right? The unique regulatory and legal framework that you have to be cognizant of to operate as a government contractor. But it's a mature, it's a half trillion dollar industry that has 
all sorts of unique elements to it. So part of that mission with the Center for Government Contracting at Mason and the first of its kind really emanates from all of that, which is um, constantly be a student of this marketplace, you know, know what's going on with, you know, legislation, know what's going on with the business, unique business elements that make our industry unique versus manufacturing or financial services or other industries that are highly studied. Um, and so I started doing a lot of that, going to conferences. I would attend just to listen to all the experts talk and take as many notes. If you're going to be an entrepreneur or a leader in our industry, and you're now going to be managing people, you know, they're looking at you not only with that positional authority, right, getting academic, but, you know, really from your into the, your knowledge and, and what you're bringing to the table uh, as far as um, your understanding of what they're facing, right? So whether it's a technical team on the ground that is dealing with contracts issues or dealing with mission issues, you know, if you can't come and help them, well, you know, what value are you? Uh, and so anyway, I would say that that's kind of the one underpinning over everything, depending on which angle you're coming from. If you have these other weaknesses or things you don't know, always be a student of the game. So, and would you apply that to, to any industry? I would, I yeah. would. I mean, I, what really interesting thing I had, uh, as an experience with Keen, um, was when they got bought by a private equity back firm for the last year that I was there before I left, I was running their North American commercial sales and marketing organization, which was, you know, kind of odd, right? Uh, being that I'd been public sector, but it was because there was this mission intent to try to go after some of the bigger deals, the, the fortune 500. And what's interesting about commercial fortune 500, large outsourcing deals is they, they bring in procurement advisors. They don't let you talk to end users. They get board approval for a, you know, multi hundred million dollar modernization. They got to go to board. A CEO is not going to normally do that, which means it's in the public domain and aware, and you're aware of it two years before they're actually procuring. Well, that's just like federal, right? I mean, we know that, that this is coming down. And, and so there were some attributes that I think they wanted to leverage. But the real experience that was interesting is whether I was having to prepare for a meeting at Goldman Sachs or Procter & Gamble or Toyota Motor Credit, right? I mean, the, all of these firms that we all know you had to understand their business. And if you're talking to the CIO of Toyota Motor Credit, if you don't understand the financial services marketplace and all the piece parts of running a financing company um, versus talking to Toyota Motor or Hyundai and understanding the manufacturing side and everything that was going on there, whether it was robotic implementation, systems that were on the floor, supply chain issues. And so I used exactly that same thing. I mean, I was talking to our functional experts. I was talking to our industry experts. I was reading as much as I could on what was happening with HIPAA laws with, when we were going in front of a healthcare, you know, provider or payer organization. And just understanding that, that, you know, what is the ecosystem of healthcare? How does Medicare, Medicaid play out at the federal level and other social service programs? How's that instantiated at the state and local, which is where a lot of that money gets pushed out? What are the private sector insurance, payer, payee, um, provider organizations, you know, the provider office of the future. It's one of the cool things that I just heard about recently as we look at instantiating this innovation hub in Arlington for Mason is the idea of really allowing all that technology around the provider stuff. And I mean, frankly, I wouldn't have understood that if it weren't for the experience I had of learning. And so, yeah, I mean, to me, it does not matter what you're doing and where you're doing it. If you're not studying it, if you're not spending energy learning about it, if you're not talking to experts, if you're not filling gaps in your knowledge, then you're doing yourself a disservice. Yeah, well, thanks so much for spending some time with us this afternoon. That was, um, I hope everyone listening, I'm sure they learned a lot about not just how Array works, but just from the discussion of inflection points and how a company's culture can be developed um, through the actions of the leadership and then the, the importance of having a mentor wherever it comes from, whether it's a family member or not, and what that does for their ability and also philanthropy and what that actually does to promote growth um, of an industry and of, uh, of anything uh, and how important that is. So I appreciate you sharing all that. Thanks, Philip. I mean, this was a lot of fun. I appreciate you. Thanks for listening to DC Local Leaders. We'd love to connect with you. Find us on LinkedIn and YouTube by searching DC Local Leaders, on Instagram at DC Local Leaders, or our website, dclocalleaders.com. You can find the podcast on Spotify, iTunes, Google, or wherever you find great podcasts. Don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe. 